is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us uh, today. We are very excited to uh, spend this afternoon hour with all of you to talk about uh, our current situation and how virtual learning uh, is the way of the future and how it's a great methodology to engage with employees, especially with millennials and especially with uh, the way circumstances are evolving around us. My name is Divya. Um, I'm a part of an organization called Inspire One. We're a 20 year old learning and development firm um, and I head the leadership development practice for Inspire One. Um, I will be your facilitator for today. And uh, we've planned uh, a fun uh, and a very interesting and engaging, uh, uh, you know, interactive session for you today. Uh, hopefully we'll have time at the end for you to engage with us and ask questions. Um, and we'll create some forum around that. I uh, would like to first take this opportunity um, to introduce my co-facilitator uh, and our expert for today, Ravi Hemnani. Uh, good afternoon, Ravi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to everybody on the call. Uh, folks, Ravi is a really accomplished learning and development leader. Currently, he heads L&D for Siemens uh, for India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. But he has a tremendous amount of experience in the area of learning and development. He's worked for a variety of firms like Dell, Nokia, Schneider, uh, you know, and very, very large employee base organizations as well. He's a really accomplished speaker. So we are fortunate that he's here with us today. He's uh, a regular face and a regular voice in a lot of really uh, important HR forums uh, in today's world. You will see a lot of interesting articles and blogs by him on his LinkedIn page and otherwise as well. He's, uh, uh, you know, I think his recent work and his area of passion right now is around creating disruptions in the way we learn. And I think that's really relevant a topic for our discussion today. So I'm very, very happy to have you with us, Ravi. Um, not to mention uh, the long list of accolades that you have won both uh, locally and internationally for some of the great work that you have done in the area of learning and development. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I will call on you to share your thoughts and uh, you know to um, add your point of view uh, as we proceed with today's discussion. We also hopefully will have enough time, like I said at the end, for people to raise questions and give you the opportunity of interacting with the audience as well. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. And I think uh, the success of this interaction would be to possibly talk to the people as well if they have some questions. Uh, yes. So let's try and find some time at the last for that. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I see that we have uh, almost 75 people who've joined us today. And uh, a special thank you for people who were here before time and we've kept you waiting for a couple of minutes to get everybody else uh, uh, the time to join in. So we're really happy that you've made time for this today. Let's move on and let's start talking about today's business context. And I think all of us are really familiar with what's happening around us, but some interesting statistics for you to look at. Um, already before COVID hit us, a lot of organizations were considering work from home, were dealing with situations with having a lot of uh, you know, remote employees anyway. Uh, some estimates that we've come across talk about the fact that uh, you know, this population of employees working of, from home has increased by over 100% since 2005. Um, it's something which has become a, a standard policy, a way of engaging employees especially amongst the best organizations, the Fortune 100 organizations in the world. They have a lot of best practices um, around how they deal with their remote workers and how they sort of set up people to work from home uh, in various situations. However, it does come with a mixed bag. So while some people thrive in these environments, some people find it much harder to cope. Um, and the unique situation really for us uh, right now is that nearly a third of us across the globe are in some kind of coronavirus lockdown. 
And so this coronavirus outbreak has, in a way, become the world's largest work from home experiment. Uh, you know, we've had two organizations have had to figure out how people who uh, never considered this option or jobs were not set up in the manner and IT infrastructures were not set up in the manner uh, to allow them to work remotely and now all engaging from home, all working from home. So this is really uh, a big learning opportunity as well for organizations across the board. Since the topic really today was engaging and using virtual learning as one of those ways of engaging, I thought it will be nice to start with talking a little bit about employee engagement. And since we have um, you know, a lot of our HR colleagues on this webinar today, I think this is not something which they are not familiar with. But really, um, an engaged workforce is critical for your business success. And we also know that one of the strongest levers to engage with your employees is learning and development. Uh, unfortunately, what we're also seeing, and I've been coming across a lot of articles and research on this topic recently, as well as spoken to a lot of our clients. We've been doing a lot of client webinars and gaining some of this insight as well. The first casualty uh, for a lot of organizations during this corona period has been workplace learning. Uh, in India, in, and especially in uh, parts of Europe and Asia, all your face-to-face -face interactions and learning programs are practically canceled till the end of June at least. Um, in America and other parts of Europe, they're, they're down to 50% or less than that in their planning phase for these kind of learning interactions. Another interesting piece of research, uh, I've been, we've been studying how millennials behave and what kind of learning practices and engagement philosophy is important there. And ability to learn and progress is a very important part of, for millennials as part of the employer's brand is concerned. However, close to half of them don't really think they're learning fast enough. And this could be when opportunity presents itself, this will be reasons why they will uh, you know, look for alternatives. So despite the fact that we are constrained with current situations, learning and development continues to remain very, very important. And so therefore, how do we do it if we are not able to do it using our tried and tested uh, old fashioned methodologies? And it's time for us to think agile and think strategically about what those learning and development methodologies are likely to be for the future and how do we best use some of those. So the future, um, you know, companies have done a lot right now to set up the infrastructure to help people work from home and remotely. And a consequence of this is going to be that a lot of HR leaders we're interacting with will continue to want a certain proportion of their employees to work from home to leverage this infrastructure that they've put in place, especially if this experiment turns out to show that productivity is not compromised, quality is not compromised, and in some ways, pe some people prefer this kind of a work arrangement. However, there are several implications of what we are going on through at the moment. And um, I think it's very clear that not all kinds of jobs will be relevant into the future. And new ways of working and therefore new jobs will get created over time as we evolve in how we work and the kinds of industries uh, that sustain themselves through this kind of a uh, you know forced change upon all of us. Uh, a lot of people I've been speaking for actually feeling people in IT, our colleagues in HR, are feeling that uh, actually productivity has gone up. We've lost sense of home and work, and a lot of us are just working much longer hours. Uh, Ravi, I was speaking with to you about this earlier as well, and you said that you know there is no really begin and end time to work and the days are becoming longer and busier uh, because a lot of things that we could walk across to somebody and get done we are scheduling more calls more interactions we're checking in on our people much more frequently we're learning to navigate our technology uh, you know frameworks to try and get things done we're finding new ways to stay connected with our clients and our customers so all of that is actually creating a lot more work for some people and while Productivity uh, in a lot of situations is either maintained or increased, so has the workload. And one of the uh, casualties of that is, of course, time for training is not that readily or easily available as we think it will be. So a lot of people may have the conception that, you know, you're sitting at home, 
uh, you may not be doing anything, so let's invest in your training. But a lot of people really don't have that luxury. And that, again, doesn't mean learning and development is not important for that population. We just have to be very creative, innovative, and tech savvy in how we deliver some of those learning methodologies to those people. And so um, really we have to think about how we reskill and how uh, we adopt virtual and digital ways of learning to try and meet some of these challenges. Ravi, your thoughts about this? I've been speaking for a while. What are some of your experiences in the current situation? See, what, what I feel is, uh, as you rightly said, a lot of people uh, have become more busy. Uh, more busy because now uh, a lot of them have to do a lot of home home related work as well. They That's don't true. have help coming home. I'm That's sure all true. of us experience this pain. Uh, so we're learning to do things ourselves. That's one good part of it. And of course, the challenging part of it. So the second good part of it is that uh, we're able to spend more time at home with the people whom you should have spent more time. Uh, but when you look at the work uh, uh, related uh, pressure or uh, the amount of time that we are spending at work, I think that has increased. Uh, and, and that has increased largely for functions which are in support uh, side of the business. Uh, the functions which are dependent on to be in the field, for example, um, some of the people who need to work in the labs, I think they possibly are able to find some free time. A lot of people who are uh, whose job is independent of uh, being on the field, uh, the desk jobs, I think they are finding it more difficult to manage because uh, something that you could have just walked across the table and get it done, now you're organizing conference calls, phone calls. Mm -hmm. In daily yeah. cases, you're getting calls uh, evening 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, uh, and that's becoming strainers for a lot of people. Uh, today is a Labor Day. Uh, we all are on this call. Since morning, I already finished five or six work-related calls. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it is definitely becoming difficult for a lot of us. And in this situation, uh, if we are going to go back, uh, saying that we should learn more, I think it's going to be uh, difficult. We need to find ways uh, and means to go to people. I mean, not that we, while we are becoming busier doesn't mean that we should stop learning. I think this is. Uh, a best time that we can invest in skill development of people, but we need to find the right ways of doing things. That's the key. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. Completely, completely in agreement with what you you're saying, and that's exactly what we're also hearing from a variety of other organizations. Uh, so I think there is consistency in some of that. So when uh, we think about some of these challenges, and we think about the fact that learning continues to be something that we would like to focus on. Uh, it brings us to the topic of creating very engaging, very rich ways of learning through virtual mediums. And I think with today's technology, uh, it is becoming easier. Already uh, before this, in our learning and development business, we were finding a lot of organizations wanting to at least have a blended approach. So come and do a workshop, but have a lot of uh, virtual engagements pre and post uh, to stay connected, to see the entire learning journey through, to build impact, to measure impact. So already the world was moving more towards looking at not just learning programs, but learning journeys and uh, blended learning journeys, which uh, you know looked at some of these technology interfaces effectively. Now that we are in the space of looking at more pure play virtual learning design, um, we've been working with several organizations and come up therefore with some interesting things for you to consider. You know, design principles to keep in mind when you formulate and design these learning journeys. The first thing I'd like to say is that, you know, um, and I think Ravi, when you and I were speaking, you mentioned this as well. It's not just about creating content, but it's about curating content. So we often um, uh, are not great at leveraging the material already available via various learning platforms and uh, you know, e-learning modules available to our people. So the first thing to do is think about learning through reflection and self-learning and leverage some of the rich content that may already be available and can be curated very smartly. 
for your people. The second design principle really is, uh, you know, trying to replicate and create uh, that in-person experience through a virtual session, which is very engaging and has a really deep and rich uh, concept and, you know, uh, knowledge that is passed on. But in that shorter amount of time, doing it in a manner in which the right messages stick. So your webinars need to be very, very smartly designed so that the core concepts that you want are, you know, are well covered, well structured, and well constructed in the scope of all of the other information and pieces you want to build into those webinars. People also learn through nudges. And uh, there are a lot of smart, um, mobile-based, micro-learning, gamified ways of reinforcing through nudges, through providing you know, very quick ways of reinforcing what you've learned and extending that knowledge and getting great analytics out of that to say, all right, where could some of those gaps still be? What is the supplementary knowledge uh, this learner needs and how can that be provided? So learning through nudges in a more constant, ongoing, agile manner, because these are ways and uh, methodologies where content can very quickly be pivoted from one point to the other to keep you know, changing business scenarios in mind. Of course, all of us know this, that when we have the opportunity to teach and share what we've learned, learning tends to stick much more. Uh, so how do you build into your learning journey watch in the virtual world? Some of those elements where there can be teachbacks, there can be learning cascades and sharing uh, so that people have a chance to practice some of the skills and concepts they might have picked up. Learning by applications. So individual action projects, team action projects even, again, can be very easily set up using technology, can be very personalized, individualized using technology. Uh, can be monitored, coached virtually as well. And again, give learners a great opportunity to try what they've learned and to experiment with what they've learned. So learning by application is another very important design principle uh, in our view. Learning by observing. So in a lot of the learning journeys that we are building, uh, we don't want to forget the leaders and the best practices within the organizations. So getting leaders to come in and coach, record videos, to sponsor, to talk about objectives, to do check-ins, to even become coaches for some of these projects and programs that people are doing uh, and share observations and shadow people. A lot of these uh, interesting techniques can be included. Uh, they are very effective. Uh, they're a great break from uh, just sitting by yourself and learning. They're a great break from traditional methodologies as well. And of course, learning with peers. So creating enough opportunities through the entire virtual uh, learning journey where people are interacting with each other, they're bouncing ideas of each other, they're maybe doing small reflective exercises together. Um, and a lot of organizations, including us, have started to put together a great catalog of what could some of these quick uh, learning activities and peer groups be and what are some of the great benefits of practicing some of those skills with your peers uh, to make learning stick. So here are some thoughts for you in terms of, uh, you know, our seven design principles for you to keep in mind as you construct and you uh, think about constructing uh, ways of engaging with your learners virtually. It's important to keep in mind, your, of course, your business objectives, but what's the best way to get there? And uh, what's the best way to engage with people at multiple levels using multiple platforms and technologies? So uh, talent development in the virtual world, you, uh, you know, can put together, like I said, great engaging virtual journeys. Even webinars that we do in a lot of companies uh, are doing a lot of webinars right now to try and pass on a lot of interesting information to people to uh, talk about virtual collaboration, to talk about virtual timekeeping, to talk about managing your emotions in these situations. A lot of common topics that we're coming across right now. But these can be really smart webinars again where you draw the real world connect, you continue to build core concepts and you leave people with very clear applications of what they have learned. Um, in the space of digital learning, there's a lot to consider and I'm running through some of this because I want to give uh, Ravi you the opportunity to talk about each of these a little bit 
based on your experience as well. In the space of digital learning, like I said, there's a lot of gamified micro skill development that can happen. There are some great um, learning systems and e-learning platforms that can be integrated. Um, look at what you already have, what can be leveraged, your internal centers of excellence and the, the, you know, the curated content that you already have and see how it can be fitted into some of these platforms. And of course, uh, even things like your one on one coaching, et cetera, and assessment tools are very adaptable in terms of being flexible to fit um, in the virtual world. Ravi, I'm going to take a pause here and ask you for your point of view. So, yeah, I think um, it's, it's the new normal. I'll say virtual learning definitely is the new normal. And we need to find ways uh, to identify how virtual learning can really help uh, people development holistically in different ways. And, and uh, I like your seven step design model of virtual learning. Uh, it's something that I got to learn during this conversation. So that's quite cool. Um, I like to pick it up from you guys and see what I can do about it. And of course the application of uh, and virtual learning in different areas of people development. I think that's the key. Excellent. I want to share with the group uh, one or two other concepts very quickly, Ravi, and then hand over to you. Here are some best practices in terms of live virtual sessions. Um, again, with technologies like MS Teams and GoToWebinar, uh, Zoom, WebEx, um, there is a lot that you can do in these live virtual sessions. You can include videos, you can bake in mini scenarios, virtual role plays, virtual simulations. Uh, you can run live polls, have breakout rooms for people to do breakout activities. So technology is helping us uh, simulate a lot of that face-to-face -face workshop experience. Um, and in some ways, these, uh, you know, all of these things, when they're built into your virtual session, it makes it very interactive. It holds the attention. So it's not like uh, for a person is just listening to an, you know, a, a voice without a body. You're getting to participate. You're getting to share your point of view. Um, and in some of the experimentative uh, webinars we have run, trying a lot of these various things like virtual role plays, et cetera, we've had some great feedback um, and some great experiences from people because they're, uh, you know, much shorter. They're not spending the entire day doing this. It's a 19 minute or a 120 minute or even a one hour long webinar uh, with some great content packed in in a very nice format. So keep in mind some of these uh, best practices because these will really help you put together your your virtual live sessions, your webinars in a much more effective way. Um, on the same topic, I'm just going to very very quickly cover some of our inspire one methodologies uh, you know just when we are designing these webinars there are a couple of things we like to keep in mind for every session that we we put together the first is of course it's always nice to make sure you're still building that one-on-one -on -one rapport setting the ground rules and making sure that you know learning objectives are very clearly laid out it's also equally important to make sure that you're building the real world connect. So it's not just a, a topic that we are discussing today. There's a reason, there's a business agenda, there's a leader who may come in and tell you why this is important, what the benefit it, it presents for you personally, as well as the benefit it presents for the organization in light of some of the goals and strategy of the company. So it's very, very important to bake that in at the start of the webinar itself. Then when it comes to the core concept, uh, of course, we, we use presentation tools, but like I said, you use polls, you use a chat window, you use game-based assessments, you use video and breakout rules. This game-based assessment is really interesting. We've experimented with that in a couple of live sessions where people are asked to switch on their phones and run a quick micro activity. Uh, you're then able to show the leaderboard and talk about learning and skill gaps in a very live and interactive manner. And it just gives people a multiple of mediums that they're engaging with to hold their attention. Uh, so it's been a really fun experiment and a lot of uh, uh, interesting small concepts in a very competitive way in some places get through 
quite nicely using this gamified learning within the webinar structure. And um, of course, um, um, of course, there is the possibility of case studies, self-assessments, all of that, that can be built in while you are thinking about the application activity. So these are some tools and tips we wanted to share with you in designing virtual programs. We have much more information. But Ravi, what I'd like to do now is for you to take over and run the little interactivity that you had in mind. Sure. Uh, so if I can be promoted as a presenter and then I'll share my screen. Yeah. So in the meanwhile, till I am sharing my screen, I'll request all of you to pick up your phones uh, and be ready with uh, your browser on the phone. And I'm already displaying, uh, you need to go to www menti.com and once you go to menti.com you have to put in a code 620640 i repeat 620640 so you go to menti.com and type the code 620640 once you do that you have a simple question uh, I just thought I'll collect some some thoughts from you. How are you spending your time during this lockdown? There are four options to answer. You can just type one word as an answer, and you have four options to answer, and submit your response. Wonderful, cooking, working. So you will see responses coming on the screen. Yeah. Self-development and learning has popped up, Ravi. Yeah. I thought the HR was too busy in supporting the business. <laughs> well, a lot of people are, are cooking because you see a lot of uh, Instagram and Facebook posts about a lot of experiments in the kitchen. So that yes. I'm not surprised about. And number one, of course, remains working because we are all very stretched, as you mentioned. Yeah. So let's see, I don't want to influence people with the answers coming. I really want you guys to answer what, what you really are doing. So don't get influenced by what others are answering. I really want to see what you are doing. And I'll request each one of you can try this. It's quite cool. And some of you must have used it already. And for some, this must be new stuff. So we have 35 responses yeah. as of now on this question. Generally, some people will take time to just type in and respond. So maybe another 30 seconds more will take. But this is quite cool. So a lot of people working, cooking, learning, reading cleaning working from home webinar attending webinars yeah that's wonderful yes so i was actually talking to a friend of mine and we were discussing we need to have a webinar to choose which webinar to attend so i, I'm, I hope this will <laughs> some sense for you yeah okay so 41 responses uh i think majority of you would have answered assuming that Okay, so I'll go to the next question. How many of you believe that you have acquired a new skill during this lockdown period? So say yes or no. I'm gonna ask you which skill, yeah? A new skill. I was actually thinking of putting one more question up after this that uh, how many of the people who said yes cooking is the new skill that you have acquired so <laughs> good but uh, i'm glad to see the people are acquiring new yes. skills it can be anything yes. i mean uh, uh, i was talking to my sister and, and she picked up something that she left in childhood she started sketching again so it's not necessary that you have to pick up only work-related skill. It can be anything. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, learning new things is important. Yeah. 
Correct. Correct. Okay, I'm still getting responses, and I have one more question after this. So I'll just. And not to influence people, not to influence people, Ravi. But one skill that a lot of people I am talking to are learning is just this technology. You know yeah. how to, yeah, to your meetings and your calls between MS Team and Zoom and setting up all of that and learning the functionality of some of that has been quite eye-opening. Actually, I must tell you, yesterday I was trying with my office colleagues. We use MS Teams in office. And MS Teams has a really cool feature where you can set up your background on the camera. So you feel like you are in uh, in Miami and there is a beach background, <laughs> and those are animated backgrounds. So, so sometimes you can really bluff people, you know, uh, by coming on the camera. It's quite cool. Okay, so I'll go to the last question. Yeah, this is going to be interesting because a lot of us on the call i'm assuming are either from hr or from learning and development yes Good. So we have an audience which is quite awake, uh, and uh, still we have kept the interest up. So this is good to see. That's good to see. Yes. Yeah. So I don't know if you have used this kind of a voting option for the first time, and if you have, uh, then I'll request you to try this yourself. It's quite cool. Uh, just log into mentimeter.com and try and explore. This is a small takeaway for you. If you have not used it, uh, do start using it. I, I have been using this even from the days before lockdown, even in the classroom setups, we've done some quizzes, uh, we run some polls, some votings, and a lot of things we have done using Mentimeter. So it really works well. And, and it's quite exciting to see people uh, uh, responding to this, using their mobile phone, using technology, and it works beautifully well. I mean, on a, on a webinar where you, we are not able to talk to each other over voice, uh, you can only hear one-sided uh, conversation. I'm still able to get your response through our online platform. That's wonderful. And okay, I think so, the, uh, results, the results of your uh, little poll also have been quite interesting, Ravi. Yeah, there are I, I, a few okay. who feel... There are a Sorry. few who feel we might go back to uh, non-virtual ways, a small proportion. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the majority feels that this is going to be the new normal. Yeah, I think uh, my view about this is that, yes, this is going to be the new normal. Uh, virtual learning, uh, e-learning, simulation, gamification, that's the future. Uh, uh, the, the workplace will transform. So one thing that will change or something that will happen after lockdown is digital. Uh, we will digitalize uh, the way we work, not only learning. I think everything around us uh, will digitalize. I mean, we are not going to go back uh, in a lifestyle where we were, the way we were working in the past. Social distancing will become the new normal. Masks will become the new normal. Uh, handshakes will no longer be there for quite some time. So it's not going to be easy. And I think for a period of time when people start doing it, uh, it will become a habit as well. So they will start finding new ways of doing uh, things in virtual or digital environment, and they will start enjoying it. And there are definitely some good benefits out of that. Having said this, I think classroom can never die. Classroom will always be there. But uh, yeah. if I was doing 80% classroom and 20% virtual, I think uh, this will change at least to uh, possibly 40 to 50 percent of classroom uh, only left out, or maybe not even that much. All right, great. Uh, uh, let's switch back to my presentation, and I'd like to now uh, use the rest of the time to, um, you know, uh, really engage with you and get some of your uh, thoughts, etc. On some very specific questions that we've put together. Sure. Um, so, um, we'd like to ask you first and foremost just to tell us a little bit about your overall learning and development strategy uh, for Siemens in this current situation. So, how have 
your LND systems adapted to the COVID uh, crisis? And you know, what are you doing in this scenario? Okay, uh, I must say that we were a little blessed in this case because we had been working on uh, digital learning for quite some time. We had brought in various forms of learning uh, for some of those on the call with whom I've interacted in the past already. Uh, I have already shared also in those and some of the blogs that I've written I've also shared. So over the last two to three years we have been uh, consciously working to bring digital element in, in the training in a big way. Whether it is mobile based learning or whether it is an AI based learning, uh, bringing simulations, gamifications, virtual learnings, e-learnings, all of that is something that we were already doing. And somewhere in the end of last year, we introduced also a new learning experience platform, and that was a game changer. Uh, I will say, uh, though the situation is not a good situation where we want to be, but uh, for us, the timing was right. We launched the platform, and uh, I think this is the time when we have been quite promoting it in a big way. So one of the, the the biggest element of our learning strategy in this times has been to promote that we had already designed. And in a way, uh, because we are promoting at this stage, it is working quite well for us. People are accepting it. Uh, and, and they feel that uh, it's a good timing that we have launched something like this. So I will say it's blessing in disguise that we launched something without anticipating that the situation will come. But this situation, in a way, is helping us in a big way. Uh, today, we have almost every uh, form of digital learning available with us, which we are offering to the employees. So it's working quite well. Uh, second element of the strategy is uh, uh, driving various initiatives. When I say initiatives, uh, I think in this virtual world, people, uh, you tell them that do something self-paced uh, will not work. So you, we are looking at how do we drive community-based learning? How do we drive peer learning? How do we drive various uh, initiatives? Like, for example, can we run a learning day? Uh, can we have uh, uh, leaders talk about learning in various forums? So basically bringing the community together and doing uh, a lot of peer learning uh, using the online platforms is something that we are trying. And of course, we are using technology in a big way. The third element of the strategy is, uh, of course, working on the technology that we recently launched, but how do you create a fantastic experience for the learner? For example, uh, take example of Netflix. Uh, you know, when you go on Netflix, uh, you want to go there again because you have the right kind of content uh, that is there. You have, the, the platform is quite intuitive and, and people are interested to go there again and again. Uh, last but not the least, what we also are doing is uh, knowing the fact that uh, classroom is not going to come back soon. We're also working on how we can look at learning for at least the next 15 to 16 month horizon till uh, we, we go back to, to the normal ways of working. I don't see this happening before that uh, unless and uh, until the vaccine is not out. I think we will, all of us will be uh, working in a social distancing model. That's my view about it. And uh, in such a situation, being prepared is the best way to handle the situation. And uh, we are looking at good one year to 18 months horizon and thinking what is that we can do differently, even within learning and development, uh, so that our key programs don't get affected. Right. So largely our big ticket programs, uh, which are high value programs, uh, had a huge element of classroom. And we are seriously thinking about how we can relook at those programs and redesign it in virtual modes. So this is largely... So yeah, so excellent points, Ravi. What are some of the things you're keeping in mind when you're transitioning from your classroom programs to virtual designs? So uh, the number one uh, is uh, the quality of the content, right? So are we ensuring that we are not compromising the quality of the content? That's number one. Number two, which is equally important, of course not in the, in the sequence though, is the kind of experience that you're going to create for the learner. 
right? So, for example, are you going to gamify the learning? Are you going to simulate the, the learning experience? Uh, and what are the kind of learning pedagogies that you're going to use inside, right? So, so largely, these are the few things. And of course, the usage of technology inside learning is something which we're looking at. We're looking at which are the world's best learning providers, content providers. Uh, we're looking at uh, scalability, and we're also looking at uh, how uh, we can look at a, a topic globally and then rather locally. So if uh, we are talking about uh, digital, uh, digital is all about doing things in scale and doing things with less cost so that you can reach to the maximum people. So these are large thoughts around uh, putting a virtual strategy in picture. And just, I know you've already spoken this, of this in the larger context, but what are some of the distinct advantages you're finding in this virtual space, which, uh, you know, uh, may push you towards using more and more of this into the future? See, a uh, few advantages. One, of course, as I said, uh, people, uh, the scope or the scale that you can achieve with this is much higher. Right, so that's that's one big advantage. The second big advantage is that you can reduce cost drastically. So with the same money, now you can go to hundreds of people and offer the uh, the best quality content, uh, then offering to less number of people. Right, so that's that's big game changer for us. Uh, the third is standardization of content. So some uh, just to give a simple example, we are a global organization. We have we are spread across uh, so many countries around the world. Pick a simple topic, for example, first time manager program. If you let every country design a program, every country will have a different content. So can we look at standard content that can be delivered digitally across the world on a topic of first time manager? I think the content does not change much. Uh, it is a little bit of localization, some of the tools you might want to change, but largely what you want to teach in a first time manager program would not change. So can we look at standardized content? Can we look at global content, uh, scale it up and reduce the cost and therefore reach maximum number of people? So these are the kind of advantages that, that we definitely see in a virtual setup. And the big one, uh, the, uh, the, so the two other things I want you to touch upon, you've already spoken about your learning platform that you were fortunate in, the, in its timing that it's rolling out now uh, along with this situation. So you were already ahead of the curve and prepared for some of this. But talk a little bit about the use of artificial intelligence in creating that more personalized, intuitive learning journey for employees. Okay. So uh, when, it, uh, when, when you think about artificial intelligence, I think uh, the word artificial intelligence is something which is not very well understood by people. And those people who understand, uh, including myself, have a very limited understanding of it, right? So I think first we need to understand what is artificial intelligence. So in, in a simple word, artificial intelligence is uh, some logic uh, running on data that gives you an output which makes sense to you. Right, very simple. So if you apply this to learning, uh, what kind of data are you going to talk about? You can talk about learning data of trainings that people have consumed. You can talk about uh, the metadata of learning that you have available with you. So, yeah. and of course, you can talk about the employee data. When you mix all the three data and you include certain things like interests of people, job profiles of people, uh, competencies, the current skill status, competency status, etc. Then you can start running the AI engine at the back end. So if you talk about AI integration, I can simply explain you. For example, many of us would have gone to Amazon, right? So we must have uh, purchased a product from Amazon. And when you go on Amazon and buy, when you're buying a product, uh, at the bottom it says you may also like. So what's running at the back end? At the back end, it is running an AI engine, which is checking your behavior, behavior on the browsing behavior. And it is actually looking at a similar product that it can recommend you at a similar cost, probably similar color, probably similar fit, probably, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
So a lot of algorithm that is running at the back end is recommending you different product. Now you apply the same thing to learning. Let's say you are looking at a training on unconscious bias on a AI yeah. platform. So yeah. what the platform would do basically is will run algorithm at the back end and look at what are the other programs on unconscious bias that the platform can offer you. Uh, and then it will throw those programs to you. So one is, uh, you know, looking at algorithms. Second is, uh, the AI would would also help you to personalize learning for you. For example, it can give you a recommendation based on your job profile. So if you are in a HR job family, it will give you uh, HR based recommendations. If you're in manufacturing, okay. manufacturing based recommendations. So recommendations based on job family. It can also give you recommendation based on uh, your skill sets. For example, you do a skill assessment and based on your skill assessment and the gaps that are identified, the tools are smart enough to look at the metadata of the trainings that are available within the uh, platform and it starts recommending learnings for you. If your platform is strong enough, it will also run algorithms to look at what are the kind of learnings learners are are taking around the world who have similar job profiles or who, who need similar competencies so it looks at the behavior of the learner and gives recommendations based on the different permutations and combination or let me say to be more precise algorithms that is running at the back so this is the beauty of of an, in, of an ai integrated platform in today's world we call it as a learning experience platform Excellent. That's, it's, that, this is great insight. I think this is the future of learning. Um, I would like to now open up to audience questions, uh, given that we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, Vikrant, if you could just forward questions to us for us to take. Ravi, we have one question from Priya that she's asking, how do L&D leaders work towards creating a culture of virtual learning in the VUCA world? I think you've spoken a lot about this, but any other any other points you'd like to make on creating a learning culture in the VUCA world? Yeah, uh, I think the first and the foremost step here is uh, understanding your business context. The context is, is the key uh, to to be able to create any kind of culture. So if you understand the context of the organization well, the business context, then then it really helps. The second element here is uh, understanding the role of learning and development. So if you go back, learning and development was an administrative function. Uh, we had 10 programs we used to run a calendar. People used to enroll for the programs. So we were learning administrators, but we called ourselves as learning and development people. Then we became, yeah. we moved forward from administrators. We started partnering, then consulting, anticipating what changes can happen in the business. So our role transition. Uh, now we are saying that we need to become curators, right? So we need to curate yes. a lot of content. But let me tell you, because of this situation that we are in today, uh, the role of l &D will again transform. And this is my view on this, that the role of l &D will move from curation to aggregation. So what it means is that the l and departments of various organizations now will focus on off-the-shelf learning. They will no longer create too much of content. They'll go and buy the content from the best in the market, aggregate the content, put a layer of a learning experience, an AI-based platform on the top, and let the content do the job. So aggregate content and provide the content to the user because curation now will be taken care by the AI. And then the job of the learning and development will be aggregation and building the business connect and business impact, right? So how closely you can work with the business will define the culture. All right, on to the next question, Ravi. How effective is virtual learning for technical trainings over behavioral trainings? I will say uh, for technical training, which requires experience working on machines, labs, uh, to to large extent, there you can use technology like uh, uh, VR or AR. Uh, yeah. Emulations that can also be used, but it is limited. Uh, you cannot teach somebody to work on a lathe machine unless the person works on a lathe machine. 
but the it's fact true. is, uh, but the fact is that a pilot runs uh, learns to you know fly an aeroplane on a simulator. Simulator, yeah, so yes. It's yeah. Technology. Right? So yeah. I think uh, technical is a lot more easier to train on on uh, uh, virtual learning than soft skills. Because in a soft skill, uh, you need to create that connect interaction, and you need to also connect to the emotions of people, which is not so easy in a virtual world. So that's why your that's cameras, point. your interactors, your, your interactions through these uh, votings and all that comes into picture. Uh, I'm moving on to the next question for you. Uh, with organizations focusing on increasing sales and revenue, how do you get salespeople to adopt online platform? How do you get them to prioritize this, I guess, is what they're concerned about. Yeah. I think uh, anybody, whether it is sales, project, or, or customer service, if you give them a training which is going to help them in their business, which is That's going right. to help them in their job, then they will be attracted. Uh, so understanding your business, understanding what people need is important. Second, uh, how do you package it? Are you going to give them a five-hour webinar? Trust me, nobody will come. Yes, yeah? exactly. I can, yeah. Simple, yeah. I can give you a simple example. Uh, we converted our classrooms into digital. We put some, some thought behind this. We said if it is a one-day classroom, we will not do more than two webinars spread over five or six days. And the duration yeah. of the webinar should not be more than two to an hour. If it is a yeah. two-day program, then we'll not do more than three webinars. Because more than yeah. three webinars, people will not come to you. And if it is more than that, then we have to really think whether we want to convert or not. So we have in to fact, be really uh, and give micro in fact, you're, you're absolutely right. We've also been looking at training content covered face-to-face -face in one day and breaking it up into modules which are um, you know which are shorter. Um, and um, you know, and are more engaging. So you cover that content, but you don't overload with one particular on one particular day with too much virtual learning because that's also much harder for people to understand. Yeah. Um, lots of questions are coming in. I don't know how much time we have, but I'm going to try and take two, three more, Ravi. Um, what we'll also do is uh, for people who are sending questions, we'll try and forward these and put our thoughts together so we don't miss anybody out. Uh, there is one on. Um, I'm just trying to see which ones will be interesting for everybody. There's an interesting question. I think it's come from an HR consultant, and she's asking, uh, you know, if companies are managing their own uh, learning. How is the the role of consulting firms, according to you, evolving also in this environment? Do you have any thoughts on that? I'm also interested to hear that. <laughs> so uh, it's difficult times. Uh, you know, today I get approached by minimum 15 to 20 consultants every day. Uh, who are who I know they are in the market, and then there are a lot of new people who are coming. It is not easy. Uh, everybody is trying to build their own content. It's not so easy. I think uh, uh, this lockdown is also also going to screen and and uh, possibly bring down the number of people in this industry, the outsource industry, mm -hmm. to reduce. And then only the people who have the quality will survive, and others not. So if you really want to be differentiator. Then you need to one adapt uh, digital, uh, bring yes. new ways of learning. Uh, look at how yes. you can gamify or or create your interest learnings more interesting for the audience, uh, and that's the only way to survive. I think survival is will be for the fittest this time. It's going to be tough. Um, and I think uh, just before we close, the last question it was on my list of questions for you as well as come from two people here. I think Mayuri is also somebody called Mayuri is uh, forwarded this question to ask. Is now in this virtual uh, world of learning and development, have you also evolved how you measure impact of learning? Has that those methodologies also gone through a difference in the way you're thinking? Uh, yes, and I'm glad that you're saying impact and you're not saying ROI, right? So for me, yes. there's nothing like yes. our return on investment. Every anybody, somebody asks, anytime somebody asks me. What about ROI? I say it is return on impact. If yes, then we yes. talk, otherwise we don't talk. So for yes. me, return on impact in a virtual world, number one, is how many of people are getting onto the platform? That's number one. So that's a clear indication that people are going there. Uh, that's the first win. The second win is 
of the people who are going on the platform, how many are accessing content? That's the second win. The third win is of the people who are accessing content, how many of them are coming back? Right? So this is user behavior. Then it is the content that is there on the platform. What is the review that you're getting from the content? So that's the, the content topic. Third is we are also now working on application of the learning by creating forums where managers are going to talk to employees on how they're applying learning at workplace. So that would be the third measure of impact. So I think uh, largely these are three and of course, uh, leaders talking about how they see people in applying learnings at workplace or some success stories, uh, collecting those success stories and showcasing to the world. I think those also create impact. I always believe no CEO of the company will come back and say that if I've given thousand rupees for learning, how many rupees you have written back. So if you go back and tell him that I've trained 200 people on sales and they now know how to uh, do an elevator pitch in front of a CEO, and you can test it and the, the CEO actually experiences that, I think you already created the impact. Yeah, um, we're at five and I know we wanted to end, but we did start two minutes over, three minutes over time. So for people who can stay on, I'll take one or two more questions, Ravi, if that works yeah, for sure. you as well. Um, and I think both of us can attempt to answer this one. Someone's talking about how would you do role plays for a larger group of people um, in a virtual setup? And I, uh, while you think this through, we've done role plays for smaller groups in uh, a virtual setup. And you have to, you have to uh, develop these very well, and you have to give people time to work through some of the concepts before the role play is done. We've done uh, uh, instructor-led role plays where a part of the instruction team is in, involved in the role play itself. What also I think replaces role play or is a great alternative is some great online simulations. Uh, which you know help people go through some real life situations and see how they would re react in various ways. So these are probably some of the things which you do see in, in a lot of face to face interactions, which do become a bit challenged in the virtual world. I can just add into it. I think using technology in these kind of situations helps. So for example, right now we both can, are visible, others are not, and we can yeah. possibly try uh, to simulate this particular example. Second is uh, a lot of uh, uh, technology-based solutions like GoToMeeting, WebEx, Adobe Connect offers uh, breakout zones. So uh, if you're not aware, some of us, uh, the, the normal conferencing solution will allow people to connect, 200, 300 people to connect in one solution. But if you have a solution like a classroom solution on top of it, it's a layer that you need to add. And if you do that, then you can have breakout rooms and you can divide people in different rooms. You can use some technologies like uh, whiteboard, uh, sorry, concept board. And concept board can replace your flip charts that you use in classroom. So there are technologies available in the market. You can create a 3D uh, avatar based learning platform and uh, you can have people uh, join together, do role plays, so it is possible. But I think technology is going to be key. You have to invest uh, a little bit in the technology to be able to do that. Great. Um, uh, thank you, everybody, for your questions. And thank you, Ravi, for your patience in going through all those questions with us. We're out of time. So I'm not going to do a big marketing spiel here and talk about Inspire One. I think uh, we are happy to connect with people on that one-on-one -on -one separately. I just like to say that there is a lot of not just content, but methodologies that are available now with us and with several other organizations in the space of designing good quality virtual deliveries of training materials um, for sustained learning. And um, along with a lot of gamified platforms for micro skill development and a lot of great analytics, et cetera, also available to people uh, during all of this process. Um, and a lot of that uh, analytics can then be fed back, Ravi, to some of the points you're making around, um, you know, being putting together learning platforms and experience platforms that are more intuitive and look at skill gaps and individualize some of the training and learning materials that people, uh, you know, have sort of uh, available to them. Um, so on that note, any last uh, thoughts from you as we close, Ravi? Yeah, nothing. I think uh, it was a good session. I uh, we spoke about something that makes a lot of sense, and I hope 
participants had uh, something to take away. Uh, you said there are a lot of questions and I'm really not feeling good that we cannot answer all. But if uh, uh, anyone wants to connect, uh, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn, very active. So please connect uh, with my first name and last name. If you search for me, you should definitely find me. I'm, I'm more than happy to connect with you, share uh, my own ideas and also learn from what you guys are doing. I think uh, this is a time to learn. Yes. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me uh, here for this. Uh, Thank you so much. To totally our privilege and pleasure, Ravi. And thanks to everybody who took time uh, on a Friday evening to join us. Uh, hopefully, we can do more of these engaging sessions in the future and uh, learn from each other, like you're saying. So we're all going through an interesting time. And our paradigms are shifting, and we are sort of learning on a daily basis. So. Um, Thank you to everybody who's joined today. Do leave comments, questions. We will try and get back to you. Do connect with us. And Ravi, thank you so much and have a great, great weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Happy weekend, everyone. Thank you.